Hey, I've got an unusual Bible quiz for you. A little Bible trivia. I was reading through the scriptures and I found some passages which were unfamiliar to me, so I thought it might make for a great Bible quiz. If you're up for the challenge, it's going to be in two sections. The first is fill in the blanks, and the second is did you know? The first one is when Jesus spoke to the paralytic. He said, arise, take up thy blank and blank. Take up thy blank and blank. Well, as I read in the book of Luke, and I saw that Jesus said, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house, I was surprised. I thought he said, take up thy bed and walk. Maybe you were like I was. Of course, I'm quoting from the 1611 Cambridge version of the King James Version. So this is not a modernization issue. And these passages do appear in the 1611 King James Version. So... They've always been there, <laughs> at least in my life. And so I read, judge not blank, ye be judged. What comes to mind when you hear that scripture? Judge not blank, ye be judged. Now we are talking King James here. So you might have been expecting that it said lest, judge not lest ye be judged. However, the King James Version says, judge not that ye be not judged. So I thought, well, maybe I'm just confused with some other translations. So I looked it up, and there isn't one in any of the translations that I could find that says, judge not, lest ye be judged. It does not exist. Well, I thought that would make for a great Bible trivia question. Hope you agree. This one was speaking about people's belongings. I'm sorry, where they where they put their money. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the where did they put their money? Well, I thought it was odd that they put it in the bank in Luke nineteen twenty three. What do you think? They put it in the bank. Here's another one I thought was a little strange. It came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the blank. Who was Jesus talking to when he was in the temple, when he was a boy, gotten away from the caravan? Well, in Luke 2, 46, he was sitting in the midst of the doctors. I thought maybe he wandered into a hospital, but apparently it's always said that. In that day, he which shall be on the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down. Well, that was a real showstopper. Didn't know they were talking about stuff back there in the uh, Bible times. That's Luke 17, 31. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a blank of wheat fall into the ground and die. Goes on to say it abides alone. What would you put in that blank? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a Blank of wheat. Well, you can imagine my surprise when it said a corn of wheat. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abide alone, abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Well, I just reached into my memory and I just jotted down what I believe I remembered, which is verily, verily, I say unto you, Unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now, there may be 
other translations that are closer to that or actually just like that, but the King James Version is not. It's a corn of wheat. Okay, so if you got that one wrong, you're not alone. Okay, here's another one that I thought was surprising. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it. Where did this woman pour her ointment? On Jesus' personhood. Where did she pour it? Well, I recall that she poured it on his feet. But according to Matthew 26, 7, she poured it on his head. Now, you may have a perfect recollection of that, but I didn't. Let me give you another one. Speaking of Moses, when she could hide him no longer, she got a blank for him and coated it with blank. What did Moses' mommy put him in? She was ferrying him away from danger. She put him in something. Well, if you said a basket, you would be consistent with what I remembered. But when I read Exodus 2, verse 3 in the King James Version, I read something very foreign to me. So I thought it might make for a great Bible trivia question. When she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. It's almost a tongue twister. Very odd imagery. And terminology that is very foreign to me so I thought it might be foreign to you as well and so I thought I would uh, put it in my Bible trivia Bible quiz what do you think did you get that one wrong as well did you think that she put him in a basket and coated it with pitch all right so here's an interesting one I indeed baptize you with water but one mightier than I cometh the latchet of whose blank I am not worthy to unloose. The latchet of whose blank. Did you say sandals? Because Luke 3.16 says, The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. I, th I thought that was very strange. I, sh I had a vivid memory of sandals. The blank also shall dwell with the lamb. Well, this is a very enigmatic passage about the millennial reign, perhaps, about a certain animal that will dwell with the lamb. And the blank also shall dwell with the lamb. Well, if you said lion, you would be in a majority of people. However, as you go to Isaiah 11, 6, what you find is that it says the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. And of course, if you were to suggest that this is a translation confusion, what you'll find is that lion laying down with the lamb does not appear in any translation whatsoever. The wolf is everywhere. There it is in the 1611 Cambridge Version even going back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I thought that was very odd. I thought I'd share that with you. In my Bible quiz, this is a pretty familiar passage. My people blank from lack of knowledge. My people blank for lack of knowledge. Well, Hosea 4.6 in the King James says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And what's interesting is many people remember that my people perish for lack of knowledge. However, none of the translations have the word perish in them. So I'm not sure where that came from. Maybe it was some 
preacher back in the 1800s that misquoted it and it was kind of like a telephone game where it went through the entire world. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the blank against which the blank did vehemently something. Luke 6.49, but he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently. Really? Well, it turns out that in Matthew 7.26, it does say that he built his house upon the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew. That resonated. But when I read this in Luke 6, that he built his house upon the earth and the stream beat vehemently, I was taken back. Maybe you were as well. Did you get that one right? All right, now this one is the scene with the big showdown with Pharaoh. And we've got Aaron and Moses in there duking it out. And blank cast down his rod before Pharaoh. So in your memory, who cast their rod down before Pharaoh and it became a snake? There's a person's name that goes in the blank. Did you guess Moses? Because if you did, you would be incorrect. The King James Version records that Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh. Interesting. Very interesting. Exodus 7.10. And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled blank with him until the breaking of the day. Who did Jacob wrestle with? Who did he wrestle with? Well, if you said the angel or an angel, you would probably be in the majority. Maybe not. Because the scripture records in Genesis 32, 24, that he wrestled a man, not an angel. Well, that was foreign to me, so I thought I would include it in my Bible quiz. And then, of course, we have the familiar Our Father prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So go ahead and Fill in this blank. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Blank earth. I'll give you a second to start from the beginning in your mind and just read it in your mind from your heart. Go ahead. Our Father. Just let it flow. If you let it flow, you'll probably say that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven because that's what you remember. However, it actually says in earth, and there are several other interesting differences. Instead of which art, I think that a lot of people remember who art in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, of course, many people remember forgiving our trespasses. But that doesn't exist. It's debtors. So I thought I would include it in my Bible quiz. And this is a very familiar passage. And the gospel must first be blank among all nations. The gospel must be first be blank. Well, if you said preached, I think you would be in the majority. But the gospel must first be published among all nations, is what Mark 13 says. And then, of course, speaking of what most people would refer to as the rapture, there shall be two men in a blank. So these two men will be somewhere and one will be taken. So what is the locality of these two men? Did you think it was in one bed? Did you think that the two men would be in one bed? I mean, it it might beg the question, why are two men in a bed? But if you remember that they were in a field, then you might be in the majority. But I certainly 
was taken back by the fact that two men were in a bed together, and so I thought I would include it in my Bible quiz. That's Luke 17, 34. And then, of course, this passage I found to be very interesting. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the... We have found the... Speaking of Jesus... Did you say Messiah? Because if you did, you'd be wrong. John 1.41 says that we found the Messiahs. Not sure what Messiahs is all about, but that's John 1.41. It isn't what I remember, so I thought I would include it in my Bible quiz in case you had the same experience. Well, this is John 3.16, probably the most familiar passage in, in the entire New Testament. So let's quote it together from the beginning. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him, blank, not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever believeth in him, did you say shall? Because if you did, you'd be incorrect. The King James Version renders should, should, not shall. What is right? What you remember or what is written? Your descendants will be like the blank. This is speaking of Abraham, of course. God giving him the promise. Even the centerpiece of the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 28, 14. The seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Hmm. Well, I read that and it seemed a little foreign to me. As I recall, it was sands of the sea and it was nations of the earth. Genesis 28:14. So maybe you're similar to myself in that recollection. So I thought I would include it in my Bible quiz. Your descendants will be like the sands of the sea and in thee all the nations of the earth will be blessed. No? Maybe you remember it the way it is, dust of the earth. All right, and then we have Jesus. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in. Where would he not go? Well, this may not be a super familiar passage. It's John 7, 1. King James Version reads, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Well, I didn't, I didn't really, I had to adjust my glasses when I saw that. I thought it was jewelry and the L was missing. I'd never heard of jewelry. I don't know what jewelry is. So I looked at some other translations and they were what I remember, what I would expect, that he would not walk in Judea. So I thought I would include that in my Bible quiz because it was a little odd to me, and maybe you would get it wrong like I did. Here's another one. Blank for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Make your requests known unto God. Blank for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Did you say be anxious? Because the King James Version actually says be careful for nothing. But you might remember, be anxious for nothing. I did, Philippians 4, 6. Here's another one. For when I am weak, then blank, strong. For when I am weak, then blank, strong. Well, of course, we're referring to 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Well, not only is that not what I remember, but it is seemingly nonsensical. My recollection was when I am weak, he is strong. Now, maybe you don't have that recollection. That's fine. But if you do, I think you might agree that that's a little odd. 
being weak and strong. Of course, you can try to squeeze meaning out of it and render it in an intelligent way, but it seems to be uh, very um, confusing to me. Uh, but these, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and blank. This, of course, is Jesus talking. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and what was Jesus wanting those that would not let him reign over him do? What was he going to do to them? Well, he's going to slay them before me. But those mine enemies, <clears throat> which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Well, I read that passage and I was a little shocked that in all of my years of witnessing on the street, that that was never thrown up to me by Muslims who might believe in jihad or that I ever really noticed that before. Have you ever noticed that passage before? If you didn't notice it, how do you explain that? I thought it would definitely be a worthy entry into my Bible quiz. That's Luke 19, 27. For blank will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So who was it that did the killing of the firstborn when God judged Egypt? Who was it that did the killing? Many people that I've spoke with, spoken with, seem to recall a reference to a death angel. However, if you read in the Bible, Exodus 12:12, 12, 12, it says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt. And again in Exodus 12:23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. So I thought that was certainly worthy of entry into my Bible quiz. No reference to the death angel, just God doing the dirty work. For where two or blank are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. It's really not dirty work. It's the judgment of God, which is certainly not dirty. Forgive me for that. For where two or blank are gathered together in my name, there uh, am I in the midst of them. Two or more, two or three. Matthew 18, 20 says two or three. But it struck me as odd because I always remembered it as two or more. Maybe you're like me. Matthew 18, 20. Did you get that one wrong? Here's another one. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the blank. Where were God's people instructed to put the mercy seat? Upon the ark. And then where did it go? Do you remember? Take me past the outer court and to the holy place, past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face. Take me by the crowds of people and the priests who sing their praise, Lord. I hunger and thirst for your righteousness, for it's only found one place. Take me in to the Holy of Holies. Well, that song is predicated on passages that don't exist because Exodus 23, sorry, 26, 34 refers to it as the most holy place. Hebrews 10, 19 refers to it as the holiest. And Hebrews 9 refers to it as the holiest of all. I could not find one passage in the entire Bible that uses the term holy of holies. And so if you can find that, I would be very grateful for you to put that chapter and verse into the chat, in the comment section, or send me an email at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com. So did you get that one wrong? Did you say, and thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the holy of holies? No? 
Maybe you got it right. All right, here's another one. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the... He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the... Did you say a doer of the word? Because that's what I thought when I read this, but it actually says doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1.25. Let's do another one. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall blank you free. When you just let it flow, when you just let it ride, and you quote it from memory, go ahead and do it yourself. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free? How about the truth will set you free? King James lovers, John 8.32. Will the truth set you free or make you free? I always remembered set you free. So when I read that, it kind of hit me the wrong way. So I thought I would include it in there because maybe I could stump you as well. All right. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are blank. To them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Whoa, I read that and I thought, Err. to them who are the called according to his purpose, kind of hit me the wrong way. Maybe it does you as well. That's Romans 8.28, so I thought I would include it. All right, we've completed the fill in the blank section. Now here's some did you know questions. And these may be just a yes or no answer on your part. So, did Jesus ever baptize people? To your recollection, and it may be an emphatic yes. To your recollection, did Jesus Christ ever baptize people? Is it ever recorded that he baptized people in the New Testament? John 3.22 would seem to indicate that he did. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Did you get that one right? To your recollection, did Jesus ever pray for infants in the New Testament? Now, I remember that he prayed for children. They brought the children to him, and he laid his hands on them. But this passage specifically says, Luke 18, 15, and they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. I don't know if they were rebuking the infants, but I thought infants kind of jumped out at me, so I thought I would include that in my Bible trivia question. Were you aware of that? If you were, then give yourself a check mark in the yes column. Got that one right. Luke 18, 15. All right, in your very energetic study of the scriptures over the decades that you've existed, has it come into your awareness that the Bible speaks about nursing fathers, nursing babies on their breasts? I mean, it may have escaped your notice, but in Numbers eleven twelve, we have this passage. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them? That thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child. And Isaiah, which appears to have been spelled incorrectly, I apologize. Isaiah 60, 16, Thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shall suck the breast of kings. Well, if this is the first time that this two passages have ever come into your awareness, I would ask you, how is that possible? That's the kind of thing that might stick in your memory. That's Numbers 11, 12, and Isaiah 60, 16. Nursing fathers. That is uh, genetically impossible, so it, it begs the question, what is the Scripture trying to teach us here? But it's also a little uh, um, foreign to me that God would use such a such an image of that, but you know, we could debate that. Anyway, people with huge, huge names. Are you aware 
of Mephibosheth. I remember Mephibosheth. He was dropped and his feet were all jacked up. David brought him in to the king's table. But I didn't know that all these guys were in there. I'm not even going to try to say any of them. But there's the passages that you'll find them in. And if you find that to be odd, that these gigantic names with six, seven syllables are in the Bible, and you didn't know it, uh, then that's certainly worth popping into the Bible quiz. I would think you'd agree. All right, now in all of your theology, in all of your studies of Scripture and reading commentaries, listening to sermons, is it your understanding that the Bible has always represented angels as being male? Is there any passage of Scripture that even subtly indicates that there might be such thing as a female angel? Yes or no? Well, we have this passage in Zechariah, which does appear to do just that. Then lift, lift it up mine eyes and looked and behold there came out two women and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven now you can go to the commentaries you can try to spin this however you want it. But my question was very specific. To your knowledge, are you aware of any passages of Scripture that even remotely suggest that there's such a thing as a female angel? Because the commentaries are kind of wishy-washy on this, if you read it. But here you have women with wings lifting up the ephah between earth and heaven. It sounds pretty angelic to me, and that's all I'm going to say. So did you get that one right? Or did you say, no, angels are always male? Then you have to give yourself an X. You got that one wrong. Okay. All right. And really quickly, you could do this in any King James Bible that's on your shelf. You can open it up to just about any page in the entire Bible, and you will find grammatical errors that make the scriptures look like it was written by a fifth grader. Numbers 11, 13, whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? Then there's a question mark. Now, the next letter should be capitalized, and it is not. James 3, 12, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Question mark. The next word should be capitalized, and it is not. Now, this is something that I have asked people about and they suggested that that's just the king james vernacular it was just the way they punctuated things so i looked into this and i found a list of books in the style of the king james bible there's many of them and as i read them i found them to be literary masterpieces they were free from these punctuation errors and they read very clearly. Uh, there were no punctuation errors or spelling errors. So there has to be another explanation for that. And also, how did the publishers allow these um, dramatic errors to go on after years and years and years? All right, and how many times did the cock crow before Peter denied Jesus? How many times did the cock crow before Peter denied Jesus? Well, maybe you're as uh, surprised as I am to find that in Mark 14, 13, I'm sorry, 14, 30, that it says that Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this day, even in this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Well, I never saw that before, so I thought it would be a worthy entry into my Bible quiz. Mark 14, 30. Did you get that one right? 
there are passages that indicate that the cock crowed three times, but not Mark 14.30. The cock crowed twice. All right, was Daniel of the Old Testament a president? Yes or no? Was old Daniel a president? If he was, do you think you would know it? Because Daniel 6.2 seems to indicate that he was. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, well, what was he a president of? And again, if this is the first time this has ever come to your attention, how do you explain that? You would think you'd know something like Daniel being a president. I didn't, so I thought I'd pop it in there. All right, this is a uh, fill-in-the-blank one, I guess, slipped through the cracks. No man putteth new wine into old blank. And there it is already. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Well, when I read that, I thought, that's fascinating. I thought it was wineskins. Wineskins, Matthew 9, 17, and I even found in the back of the Bible, in the section where you can look up things by category, it referenced wineskins in Matthew 9, 17. However, when you go to the passage itself, it says bottles. So that's a very clear indication that my memory might be correct, but certainly is uh, worthy of entering into the Bible quiz. I think you'd agree. Now here's some concepts which I found to be foreign. Does, does God condone sin? It seems to be that in Hosea 4.14, he says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit whoredom, nor your spouses when they commit adultery. And in 2 Corinthians 11.8, we have Paul saying that he's, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. He's robbing the churches. And of course, you can suggest that the terminology doesn't mean he robbed the churches, but that's what it says. And then Proverbs 26.10, the great God that formed all things both rewards the fool and rewards transgressors. Well, if I'm a fool and a transgressor, I'm loving that passage. And then 2 Corinthians 11.4 says that if someone comes preaching another Jesus, <clears throat> whom you've not preached, or if he receives another spirit, which you've not received, or another gospel, which you've not accepted, you might well bear with him. These passages seem to indicate a shift in God's uh, leniency towards sin. Now, this one... I thought was certainly jarring when I found out that the Bible references people pissing against the wall. Now, if you were not aware of that, then you would say, how many times does the Bible use the term pisseth against the wall? You would say zero. But if you did, you'd be incorrect because it's actually six times. So your Bible suggests that people are pissing against the wall in the scriptures six times, okay? How about unicorns? How many times does your Bible mention unicorns? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it two? Now, you've studied the Word of God your entire life. If you're in your 50s or 60s, then you may have been seeking God and studying His Word for decades. And I'm asking you, right now, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, how many times does your Bible mention unicorns? What's your answer? Well, what if I told you it was nine? Would you find that surprising? Your Bible mentions unicorns nine times. There's the passages that you can look up for yourself. Does the King James Bible mention men eating their own dung and drinking their own piss? And if it does, is this the first time that's ever come into your consciousness? Because Isaiah 36, 12 says, But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master 
and to thee to speak these words? Question mark. Next word should be capitalized. Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Now, whatever commentary you'd like to overlay all that, I'm not interested in that. All I'm asking you is, have you ever read that? Were you ever aware of it until just now? Because if you're not, how do you explain that? All right, and to your recollection, does God ever command his people in the Old Testament to sacrifice turtles to him as an offering? Were, were God's people ever permitted to offer turtles? Well, we find this in Leviticus 12, verse 6 and 8, that God told them that they can bring a pigeon or a turtle dove. And later on in the same paragraph in verse 8, he says, And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles. Now, what's interesting is the word turtle dove and the word turtles are the exact same word in the original language. And so if you think about that, the translators, for some reason, chose to translate the word the first time as turtle dove and the second time as turtle. And it's been suggested that these two translations are interchangeable, but they're not. Uh, one is a bird and one is a reptile. Words mean things. So if I am permitted to sacrifice a bird, but I am not permitted to sacrifice a turtle, and the passage is um, suggesting I do uh, sacrifice a turtle, that is a problem, and it supports uh, possibly an alternate explanation because the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon for that word only defines it as a bird. There's no entomology in here suggesting that it also could be a turtle. So it's a very, um, very challenging passage. When I read that, I thought this would certainly be a great passage for my Bible quiz. All right, does the New Testament contain the word Easter? Is Easter in the New Testament? Well, we read in Acts 12, 4, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrarians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. I always thought it would be Passover. And I found these little cut and paste jobs in 2 Kings and Isaiah, where it's the exact same words. 2 Kings 19.12 and Isaiah 37.12 are exactly the same, except the other thing is they're referencing the children of Eden. And I thought that was very odd because I remember it as the children of Edom, E-D-O-M. So now you've got Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then you've got these other children of Eden. And the cut and paste jobs actually appear in several other places in the Bible, which I didn't know about. So I thought I would just include them as a trivia observation. Like this one, to your knowledge and your vast study of the scriptures, who wrote the book of Romans? Who is credited in the book of Romans as writing the book of Romans? Let me ask it like that. Well, it turns out, in Romans 16.22, it says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Now, again, you can attribute, attribute Tertius to being a scribe, and, Romans, and, and Paul was actually written by Romans, and Tertius was a scribe. But if you never noticed that, the, that there was even a scribe involved, then you would have gotten that wrong, and you just would have said Paul wrote it. But actually, Tertius was in the mix. And then, of course, you have to answer this question. Who cut Samson's hair? Who cut Samson's hair? Was it Delilah? It actually was not Delilah. Judges 16, 19, and she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. So it wasn't Delilah that actually did the cutting. It was 
one of the Philistines. All right, now this passage is, is something that definitely hit me the wrong way. Is Jesus a thing? Luke 1, 35, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. I don't know how you feel about that. You may have no reflex to that type of terminology. It may, it may be in your memory, but I thought I would include it in here because it just hit me the wrong way in a number of ways. All right, was Abraham married to Hagar? You know the story. He had his wife, Sarah, and then Hagar was in the mix. Did Abraham marry Hagar to your recollection? Yes or no? Did Abraham, was Abraham married to Hagar? Yes or no? Okay, Genesis 16, 3, and Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. He gave Hagar to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Say what you must, there it is, Genesis 16:3. All right, and what is John the Baptist's last name? I discovered that we now know John the Baptist's last name. Because in my recollection, he was just John the Baptist. But actually, in Luke 7.20, we find out that his name is John Baptist. When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee. Interesting. So he's John Baptist, the Baptist, according to Luke 7.20. And then we have this interesting passage where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on two donkeys. I wasn't aware of that. Matthew 21.1. And brought the ass and the colt, brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon. It does indicate that he sat on two donkeys. And then lastly, I will end with this. Is Peter ever running around naked in the New Testament? To your recollection. Well, when I read this, I was, I was surprised because I never remembered this story. It's John 21, 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loves saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And so, you've got the lion laying down with the lamb. You've got people taking up their couch. And you've got Peter running around naked, throwing himself in the ocean. And so some of these passages that I've shared with you may have been very familiar, while others may have been very, let's say, unsettling, as it has been with many that I've shared these with. And if some of these passages that are sitting right in the middle of your New Testament, if they seem very, very, very unfamiliar, I will tell you that you're not alone. The question is, what conclusion do you draw from this experience? How do you explain this to yourself? How I would even ask you, how well do you know yourself? Do you trust yourself? Because the scriptures instruct us that we are to be guided by our ability to know things that are not knowable with the natural mind. As we read in Philippians 4, 7, for instance, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which passes knowledge. That translation, passes understanding or knowledge, is derived from the original of epinosis, which means beyond knowledge. And so sometimes, as we walk with the Lord Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, 
We have to know things with our knower, not our head, with your inner witness, not your mind. And some might call it following your conscience, following your gut or your heart. And I don't want to, but I'm compelled to quote Obi-Wan right now when he said, trust the force, Luke, it's that kind of thing. Now, additionally, on a more rational note, the scientific method dictates that if you are to draw a conclusion that's guided by truth, then you should at least be willing to consider all the options, no matter how difficult or improbable that conclusion may be. Is that correct? That's the scientific method. And you claim to be full gospel, but are you really a fundamentalist? God commands his people over and over throughout scripture to remember. My question to you, dear soul, is would God command you to do something that you were not able to do? Deuteronomy 32.7 is only one of many passages where God says, remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Your memory is just fine, thank you. Your memory can be used as evidence in a court of law to send someone to prison for life. If our memories were untrustworthy, they would have been eradicated from the judicial system 50 years ago as a form of evidence. Just one person's testimony can send someone to prison for life. You can trust your memory. So if you vividly remember something like your own name, or even something from long ago, like the street you grew up on, and you're 100% certain that you're correct, would you be so willing to just surrender that? That knowing, that certainty, because there's some new evidence to the contrary? Hebrews 10, 35, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You're doing this right now in your walk with God. You hold on to the belief that God is good in the face of some contradicting information, like evil prevailing in the world or sickness inflicting you, and you do that because of epinosis. You cling to your faith in God's goodness because God provided you with supernatural evidence to your heart and the influences of his spirit upon your spirit. Ask yourself, how do you know God is good? And you know I'm correct when I tell you that science did not prove it to you. <laughs> that is for sure. It was by revelation knowledge that you know him and you know with certainty that he is good and that he is for you. So right now, I pray on the matter at hand that God would release his revelation knowledge to you I pray that he would open the eyes of your understanding, and because God requires truth in the inward parts, that he would give you the grace to consider a matter without embracing it, in Jesus' name. So we only look and see to determine if, in fact, the body of Christ that are claiming supernatural change is taking place within the scriptures by the enemy of God is true. Just take a look. If we are correct, then it represents one of the most significant events in all of church history. What am I suggesting? I'm suggesting that the experience that you just had is not misremembering. If we are wrong, we are a deceived pack of heretics that are being socially burned at the stake for suggesting that this experience that you just experienced is an end time sign and wonder. But now that I think about it, if I'm going to be burned at the stake for being a heretic, it sounds that I might be in very good company. You might want to join us. But I'm asking you to please, from here, if these passages were so unfamiliar to you, that you would take a moment to review some material that I have prepared to help answer your questions. Because if your vivid memory and the vivid memory of a hundred of your friends and peers tell you that the lion laid down with the lamb. Will you violate your own conscience because it may go against your long-held beliefs regarding the doctrine of the preservation of Scripture? 
what if scripture actually had foretold of an end times event in which the enemies of God would be permitted to cause supernatural changes to the very fabric of space, time, and matter, which would include scripture? What if the Bible describes this event in advance so you wouldn't be fooled by it and you would pay attention when someone brought it to your attention? Would that help you to consider the possibility that these passages, which are now unfamiliar to you, are that way because someone somehow has physically changed the scriptures in the Bible that sits on your very bookcase? If you were warned in advance by God, would it help you to consider the possibility that these changes have actually been orchestrated and implemented by the enemy of God in a supernatural way? And what if the Bible even clearly indicated that there was a time limit on the protections over Scripture and that God had allowed this in his infinite wisdom? And what if the Bible clearly indicated that in the last days, which we are now in, these protections that God did place over the scriptures would be lifted? If you could see those passages foretelling this event in advance, do you think you might be willing to consider a more exotic conclusion than that you are just misremembering? Are you willing to trust your intuition, the feeling that you first had when you saw these unfamiliar passages, the shock? The what? The exclamation. What? Follow your gut. Follow your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. You don't have to make a decision. I'm only asking you to press the pause button and to look further into this matter. If there were a few passages that were misremembered here and there, it's easy to explain it away, but not 20 or 30. How could it be that some of these passages had never come into your conscious awareness? How could you study and meditate and memorize scriptures your entire life and never have noticed that there were passages like some of the ones that you just saw? Don't be like those who were praying for Peter to be released from jail. And when Rhoda came to the door and suggested a supernatural event was happening, they called her crazy. Because she was right. Especially when the Bible is a supernatural book describing supernatural things, and when the supernatural thing that the supernatural Bible describes starts happening, you force it into a naturalistic conclusion. You know, you're listening to me right now because you asked God to show you the truth, remember? Proverbs 18.13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly, and shame to him. So I'd like to invite you to hear two recordings that I made that will give you all of the biblical context for what you are really experiencing. I would ask you to review these two recordings before you make any final decisions about your experience today. And once you have, I would ask you to contact me by email because I would like to talk to you at pleasewakeuporelse at gmail.com or you can post a comment on the video because I read all the comments and I look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so here's the YouTube channel, Wake Up or Else. Here's my email. And here is the first recording that you'll want to review. It is a 40 minute Bible study giving you biblical authority for this being an end time sign and wonder. And the second one addresses the idea of the preservation the doctrine of the preservation of scripture and how the Mandela effect can actually happen even though the doctrine of preservation of scripture might indicate that it can't. Thank you for your time today. I do look, hope that uh, I will hear from you soon after you've had a chance to review these materials. God.